We've been covering the railroad strike, uh, excuse me, the railroad workers attempt to strike uh, for actually, I think we started covering this like two months ago, maybe, but we've been covering along the way. Uh, this story is still developing. There's more and more information that's coming out as time has gone by. And one of the things that has come up is a statement from DSA about their feelings about the way that some of the squad members chose to vote in reference to preventing the railroad workers from striking. We will get to that. But there's a lot of things going around about what the railroad workers wanted and what uh, Congress wanted. You're hearing it from so many different people. And I saw this interview clip here. Now, this was actually from CNN. So I'm surprised that this was actually on CNN. And I think that you will be surprised too when you hear what he has to say. So here is a railroad worker here on CNN telling you what they wanted and how he feels about the way that things turned out. Listen to this. This is important. You voted for President Biden, but now you say you feel like he's turned his back on you. Why? Well, what we've seen with this great rail strike of 22 that has ended very undramatically is we've seen unionized workers right to bargain collectively get trampled on their voice has not been heard. They voted against a contract. We have a pro-labor president who loves to, you know, pat himself on the back for that. <clears throat> and when the going got tough, he turned his back on the people he's supposed to be looking out for. Now, I want to pause here for just a second. Again, this gentleman who's a railroad worker voted for Joe Biden. And he is disappointed. Of course, he's not the first. He won't be the last. But that's important for people to understand. This is not a Trumper. This is not a Liz Cheney conservative. This is someone who voted for Joe Biden. And I want you to look at the tentative rail agreement. Wage increase by 24% over five years. 1,000 cash bonus per year for five years. One paid sick day. Improved health care benefits. You see, you got to define that. Like, what does that mean? Improved how? What services were improved? More schedule flexibility. No change to sick leave. So that was the tentative rail agreement. Okay? Let's go on. And with this bill that is now going to go to President Biden, pass the House. It had a separate measure that actually had seven paid sick days for you and your colleagues. That did not make it through the Senate. They voted against it. Are you asking President Biden not to sign this bill? It's a good question. Um, you don't go against what your members vote for. So, the, you know, shout out to Jamal Brown for getting that bill going and looking out for us, but the sick days was more of a distraction. The main You hear this? This is important, guys. This is why I wanted you to hear this clip before we get into the whole DSA stuff. He is telling you the sick days were more of a distraction. You don't vote against the way the members want you to vote. So listen to this. Take it back just a second. Just a little peep was more of a distraction. The main attraction here is Joe Biden forced a contract on our unionized workers who voted against it. Say that again. Did everybody hear that? He said that Joe Biden forced a contract on unionized workers who voted against it. Everybody needs to hear this. Because this is the piece. This is why a lot of people go back and forth. Like, I don't understand. They didn't do anything wrong. Listen to this. Listen, one more time. Here is Joe Biden forced a contract on our unionized workers who voted against it. And That's what he wants you to focus on. That's right, Dave. Exactly. They should have gone on with the strike. Thank you. See what I mean? So for people who are confused about what transpired here, this is a railroad worker letting you know that a contract was forced upon them 
that they did not want. Let's go on. And listen, we don't want to strike, but the only way we can get a fair contract is to strike. That's our only leverage. The rail carriers do not negotiate in good faith. The Railway Labor Act does not have time limits on these contracts we negotiate. So that can mean we can be negotiating a contract for five years. There's no timeline, guys. There's no deadline. You see this? And we have no power to get a good contract. Our only leverage is to strike. And I feel like this whole process, the workers have kind of been demonized where it's like, y'all are trying to shut the economy down. You know, we're not. We're out here working nope. 14 hours a day in all weather conditions. Most of us work outside. You know, we need some sick days. You now, why, why aren't you guys talking to the rail carriers? We're out here every day working, moving freight, making things happen. And when... Just need to pause here for a second because I want you to see uh, these symbols here. Brotherhood of Railroad Signalmen, International Brotherhood of Boiler Makers, Brotherhood of Maintenance and Way Employees Division, Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Workers, Railroad Unions Voting No on Labor Deal. So I wanted to point that out uh, to you there. And then also you have to keep in mind, I think this is, is very important what he's saying here. A lot of time they're working outside. Notice he mentioned, why aren't you guys talking to the rail carriers? Like, why aren't they talking to them? I'm really surprised CNN actually aired this interview. I, I really am because he's criticizing the Biden administration and he voted for Joe Biden. Let's go on. The leaders we vote in who are supposed to support us, you know, turn their back on us. Yeah, the system's broken. The system is broken. And this is why I called this, I say it was like a month ago when I first started talking about this, they could go on strike. I called it back then and I said, bump it, just go on strike. Start getting the funds now. Start doing mutual aid. Um, I believe two of them will be here Thursday night. And I'm going to talk to them about this. Like, why didn't you just go on? Because the thing is, is this, like he just told you, the only leverage that they had is to go on strike. That's the only leverage they really had. And that's why I thought they should have just done it. What's that, uh, John to Emily, shut it down. That That is their leverage, is to just shut the shit down. Now, why am I bringing this up again? Because I told you this story has not gone away. It's been changing every day. There's more and more information coming out. Now, because of the way that some of the DSA politicians in Congress voted, DSA also had to issue a statement. Because if you know anything about DSA, you know that they are not strike breakers. They stand with the workers. And DSA members are supposed to do that as well. One of the big things, one of the key elements about DSA is that for whatever reason, you are supposed to back the unions, you're supposed to back the workers. You do not become a strike breaker. So I want to show you this statement from DSA because this leads to the piece here about AOC and about Cori Bush. And then there's something else I want to show you after that about where do we go from here. So let's get into this statement. Again, this is from DSA, National DSA. It goes on to say, stand with rail workers, build worker power. Make this larger for the people in the back that have to put on reading glasses for just a second. This fall, the majority of railroad workers rejected a tentative agreement brokered by their bosses and union leadership that would not include sick leave. An end to precision scheduled railroading and other fundamental improvements to their working conditions. Railroad work is notoriously brutal. On call nearly around the clock, workers suffer regular, often fatal accidents due to overwork and exhaustion. 
And yet the TA lacks any paid sick leave, let alone the 15 days demanded by rank and file workers. Unions representing the majority of all rail workers rejected the deal. The eight other rail unions that did ratify the deal pledged to honor the picket line should other unions strike. Biden and his administration sold out workers when they imposed this terrible contract on railroad workers through the Antiquated Railway Labor Act. We condemn the move by President Biden and Congress to force over 100,000 rail workers to accept the TA by denying them the legal right to strike. Again, denying them the legal right to strike. Our ultimate leverage as workers under capitalism. So this goes back to what the railroad worker just said. Their only leverage was to go on strike. Let's go on. When every major power in the country, the center, the right, and our laws aligned against the workers, DSA members in Congress introduced a legislative push for sick days and forced a vote on the measure, which did not, did not succeed. We are proud of DSA member Rashida Tlaib's vote against the TA for sick days. Any vote by Congress to impose a bad contract on workers sides with the boss and contradicts democratic socialist values. So again, uh, I called this out this morning on Rising that they're not following, some of them actually, are not following the principles of DSA. So they're telling you here, it contradicts democratic socialist values. Now here's the part where they're gonna talk about AOC and Cori Bush. We disagree and are disappointed with the decision of DSA members, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Representative Cori Bush to needlessly vote to enforce the TA. The key word I want you to pay attention to here is needlessly. Do you see what they're saying here? Needlessly vote to enforce the TA. The members are the union and the majority of the members voted to reject the TA. Socialist elects, I'm going to come back to this term because this is what they need to stop this. Socialist elects must stand with unions when they reject a TA. The vote to defend workers' right to strike was an opportunity to further organize the public in solidarity with the rail workers. The left cannot afford to miss these Moments, and that's with an exclamation point there. Here's the problem. Socialist elects. They're not socialist. And part of this blame goes to DSA. DSA, for whatever reason, they gave people the idea that people like AOC, Cori Bush, all the other members of the squad, that these democratic socialists, which are actually by definition, they're actually social Democrats. They gave people the idea that these individuals are socialists. They're not socialist. Socialism involves workers owning the means of the production. They're not gunning for that. What DSA is trying to do is they want something that's a little bit more like Denmark. A little bit more like Norway, like those, like those social programs that they have there. And those things are great. But I think this is where part of the problem lies. They started calling them socialists. They started calling themselves socialists. The media started calling them socialists. And so people are expecting them to actually, or those of us who had supported him, we're expecting them to push some type of socialism, and they're not. They are not socialist. So I think people really need to learn the definition. There is a difference between socialism and a social democrat. The squad, what they're, the squad, and this includes Bernie Sanders too, when he says like, I'm asking for something more like what Denmark has. Denmark is not a socialist country. 
So I have to point that out. So I blame DSA for this because they're letting their members go around and refer, they're referring to their members as socialists. And then their members are calling themselves socialists and is getting the wrong message to people. So that's one part. So obviously DSA was not happy about that decision. My problem is what is DSA going to actually do about it? And I mentioned this on rising earlier today. What are they going to do? Why are, why is AOC and Corey Bush still a member of DSA? This is not the first time this, I want to be very clear here. This is not the first time they have gone against DSA principles, whether it's the vote for the iron dome, whether it's not forcing the vote, which comes straight from the DSA handbook. There have been multiple times where they are not following the principles. Now, I want to show you how they mislead people. So before her vote, AOC mentioned this. I want you to see this because Lucy is, it was so brilliant. Lucy has a great memory and she decided to call this out. AOC said the last time we stood with Teamsters Local 202, we stared down a national food crisis over resistance to a $1 raise. Back then, railroad workers stood with us. They turned trains around to not cross a picket line. We won then and we can win now. Let's get these sick days. And so that's her there, right? Okay. Let's see what Lucy had to say about this, because Lucy seems to remember a little bit more than AOC does. Lucy, by the way, is in AOC's district. So listen to this. AOC is saying that she consulted with Local 202 regarding the rail worker strike in her district with whom she picketed in the past. What she is referring to is the Hunt Pikes, excuse me, Hunt's Point strike. The first strike where she was a scab for the Democratic Party. Listen to this. It goes on. And here's the article here. How Jacobin and the Democratic Socialists of America aided the Teamsters. So that was the, ar the article from um, the World Socialist website. You guys should follow them. They cover the things that uh, Jacobin will leave out. I think that's important. Even though the workers did not receive the $1 raise they asked for and the new contract even reduced their health benefits, Jacobin, AOC, and the DSA were crucial to marketing the strike as a success and an article called Proof That Strikes Work. Now, Lucy is letting you know that Jacobin, AOC, and DSA considered that strike to be a success. But Lucy is letting you know right here, they did not receive the $1 raise and the new contract reduced their health benefits. So why is that important? Because here she is here. We won then and we can win now. Let's get these sick days. You see the problem? Let's go on. Jacobin also never mentioned that the cops showed up in riot gear to arrest workers and that they were under economic pressure to vote and end the strike. There's the article there. So Lucy was smart. She did link the articles for each one of these. And it says cops arrest NYC workers during Hunts Point produce market strike. She goes on. AOC was there to support the strike by promoting the Teamster Union which did not support the Wildcat strikers with actual strike funds, saying NYC is a Teamsters town. She was also there to market Joe Biden as a significantly pro-labor president on Inauguration Day. You guys see how this works? You see how the people who are playing the inside game you really can't let them come do the outside game or lead the outside game with you because they always bring it back to voting for their party. 
this is where it gets kind of, to, this is exactly why socialist alternative doesn't do, they're not an electoral politics organization. Yes, there may be people that come out of the organization that they recommend to run for positions. But unlike DSA, Socialist Alternative does work on the ground. They do work on the ground. And if there's someone they think should run, they nominate that person to run. DSA, however, solely exists to run these candidates. So you had AOC who was here, again, someone who's on the inside, coming to help out with these strikes. And while she's there, she's pushing Joe Biden. You see how this works? Let's go on. Thankfully for AOC, she did not have to vote any which way to show her ass, which gave her the plausible deniability that she coordinated with Teamster leadership, DSA, and the Democratic Party to help quickly end the strike and falsely market it as a win. This is another example of AOC being a fraud. This is another example of AOC being an actress. Now, some people may see this and say, why are you picking on AOC? You guys need to see this. People should not be out there claiming that they won strikes that did not win. People should not be out there saying that, yes, these workers received something that they did not receive. Let's go on. Her vote to end the railroad strike removes that plausible deniability. You guys see the difference? And here's a vote here it says, why did you crush? Why did you vote to crush the ability to strike? Weird. Seems like you're a union buster when it serves your career. So you guys see the problem. This is why she is connecting the rail, the railroad worker strike with the local 202 strike. They are totally unrelated, but she is gifting us with an unintentional blooper. Local 202 was the first time she said she supported a strike, but didn't. This is the last. And that's that same post here. The last time we stood with Teamsters, Local 202. So you guys see the problem here? Here is a speech that she delivered at Hunts Point Market. Please rewatch it with the new knowledge of how she helped break up two strikes. She broke up two strikes. Oh, and by the way, why didn't DSA speak out against her then? You know why? Because she wasn't voting. This time she had to actually vote. So watch this, watch this. Now, now that you know what you know, watch this. Thank you. Give it up. Just like Danny said, you know, people started using this term essential worker this past year, but you have always been essential worker. That's right. Everybody got to eat. Every day, That's right. every day. And so just like the hospital is essential to us, our food distribution is essential to us. It's the core, it's the base of our economy. We need nurses, we need people loading trucks, we need everybody and we need you. And we gotta pay you like we need you because we do. You are not replaceable. You are not expendable. You are valuable and you are valued. And we love you. And we, and just like Danny said, I just wanted to pause it here. I don't know why. Oh, I wasn't in the app. Whoopsie. I wanted to pause it at that point because I want you to see his sign, Danny which said, says, That's the sign. Why is it? Okay. Sorry, I hit the wrong thing. I want you to see his sign, which says, On Strike Hunts Point Market. So Lucy is correct. This is the Hunt Point Strike. Solidarity of our actions that are going to get us through. It is sticking together. You know, I, you know, a lot of people, they talk about my past. I used to be a waitress. My and, daughter's a waitress. And an unemployed waitress now because of the pandemic. Because of the That's pandemic. That's where my daughter, she was here on the picket line the other day. 
and she's very upset that I'm standing next to you and she's not here. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing about restaurants is that, and not all of them, but the one that I worked with, it was right to work. We couldn't have a union. Yeah. And so we had to experience things like be forced to punch out before your work is done. We had to be paid less than a living wage. That ain't right. We got exposed to sexual harassment and other forms of harassment. Right. And she conveniently leaves out the fact that she also owned a startup. She wants you to think that she was working class. She also owned a startup, you guys. I don't want you to walk away from here believing that she was just a waitress struggling in the Bronx. That is not the case. With no one to stick up for us. And so what changes that? A union changes that. Yes. Yes. Right Solidarity right changes that. Standing together changes that. And, you know, Danny talked about how this action is not a coincidence. You know, my heart and my family and in our in our world, you know, I come from a spiritual family. We don't always believe in just coincidences, right? And so I don't believe that this action started on Martin Luther King Day as a coincidence. Now she really grandstanding. Let's let's go forward here. Themselves. That ain't right. That's not right. That's upside down. And so we, what we're doing here today is taking the upside down and making it right side up. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way we do that, we don't do that with just like a politician like myself. We do that with people and collective struggle together. Yeah. together. So I come here to just be here shoulder to shoulder with each of you all and for all of our workers here. For all of our, our other unions that are operating in solidarity coming out here, thank you for showing up. And for anybody who might be watching or hearing, who isn't part of you, who's just in the neighborhood, pull up! Pull up! Interesting, isn't it? This is the same person who voted against who voted against the railroad workers having the ability to go on strike. Make sure that working people can have a just dignified life because just like what we're talking about with king one of the things that king said is that all labor has dignity yeah, yeah. all right. labor has dignity right. and the thing that gives labor dignity is good wages solid benefits labor rights protection protection from discrimination all labor has dignity and so when i just rolled up you know on my way over here i heard that music bumping i saw the fires going and that community means something. Because that community is solidarity. And solidarity gets us labor rights. It gets us wages. It gets us improved conditions. And it gets us a better city. And so when we are a Teamster town. So she's talking about solidarity. She's talking about being a Teamster town. But where was the same solidarity for the railroad workers? Do you guys see that? You see the grandstanding. You see the, the gesture. When we are a union exactly. town. Exactly. We are Christ. a dignified town. We're a town that feeds its families, every family, that, that labor, that honors all labor. Thank you. Woo! And those homes, you know, they make us feel good because it's that, whoa, those homes feel good because it's solidarity too. This whole city is behind you. There's no working person in New York City that I can hear of or even think of that would think that what you're doing is wrong. Everybody's behind you. Everybody's behind you. And you know, So I was on rising and I did say something about that. And let me see if I can play just that little clip that I did post about what should happen, because this is the way I see it. If you have people who are part of your organization and they're not upholding the principles of the organization, they need to be removed from the organization. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're a politician. I don't care if they're a banker. I don't care if they're a lawyer. I don't care who they are. If they're not upholding those principles of that organization, they need to be removed. Now, what is that going to take? So let me show you. This is what I said this morning on Rising. I want to share this because something has to change. This is a bad look for DSA. This is a bad look for DSA members, for the organization. Okay, listen to this. 
And I think that this brings to a, lar a larger question here about whether or not the squad is actually doing what they're supposed to do in reference to that Justice Democrat strategy, and they're not. Uh, and so for me, like I talk about this often about how they're not doing a hostile takeover of the Democratic Party, how they basically just align themselves with corporate Democrats like Hakeem Jeffries. And so I think, you know, I'm someone that's on the bottom of the totem pole. I think they're going to need to hear this message from some of the organizations that they're a part of. Uh, where is DSA when it comes to the squad? because recently they issued a statement saying that they are not happy with the decisions that AOC and Cori Bush has made in reference to the railroad workers and preventing them to go on strike. So what it's going to take in order to hold them accountable, you're gonna need organizations like DSA to push back on them. And if the squad members are not following the principles of DSA, then I call on DSA leadership to remove them from that organization. But I don't think that's likely to happen. It's time for them to go. It's time for them to go. It's been too many, too many missteps. It is a bad look for them, but it's also a bad look for the organization because it makes DSA appear to be not credible. Now, here's the problem. If DSA were to remove an AOC uh, from their organization, would that affect their brand? Because it's got to the point now, like, who, what is DSA without the squad? Is that why DSA doesn't want to vote them out? They need to go. They are now strike breakers. They're not standing with the workers. They're not standing with the union. They are not upholding any of those principles of DSA. They couldn't force the damn vote, supporting the Iron Dome. And now they're strike breakers. They need to go. If any of you are watching and you are a DSA member, I recommend that you encourage DSA to do the same thing. Contact National DSA. Let's see if they respond because their leadership seems to be very weak, very weak. Contact them. Those of you in the local chapters, next time you have a meeting, bring this shit up. They need to go. It's embarrassing. It really is embarrassing. Now, I want to share this as well. Because Zineb, she's been on here before. She was a part of Justice Democrats and Brand New Congress. And she felt the need to write this uh, after everything that's happened with the railroad workers. She said, I owe an apology. I worked at Justice Dems and Brand New Congress for four years. Or Brand New Congress is for four years, sorry. As comms director, I wrote emails promising that we would hold progressive candidates accountable once elected and call them out if they swayed from the platform. We were supposed to shake up the two-party system. I believed in those promises, those promises of electing regular working people nominated by their communities who would fight for Medicare for All, a Green New Deal, ending ICE, ending wars, ending corporate money, Score, excuse me, corporate monopoly and ethically financing their campaigns. I saw some amazing candidates lose. I saw some amazing candidates lose that very well may have shaken up the status quo. And I saw AOC win. And I thought she was likely going to fold into the establishment. And she did. 90 hour work weeks, time away from home. I was doing this organizing for my daughter, just as many of you had hopes. But even, but even though I believed that things would change, I started to learn that unlike the slogan I coined, it was politics as usual. I'm disappointed as well. And I'm sorry for the false promises. My heart was with yours in hoping for real change for all of us that were struggling. We can't wait till the next election cycle to raise a ruckus. The political system breeds ego, corruption, and desperation for relevance. Can't let the progressives who are nothing but regular old Dems make us lose focus on what matters. We must organize today. And then she um, tweeted this here when she said, after AOC got famous, 
brand new Congress, not just as Democrats, launched her campaign, by the way, things shifted. BNC started drifting more towards the Dems, stopped recruiting from the community nominees and eliminated the accountability portion to maintain access and keep up fundraising. I left after that. So for those of you wanting to hear from someone who was a part of that, because she remembers what she knows what was supposed to happen and she saw what ended up happening instead. So let's take a look at that poll because I did ask you guys, should DSA remove the squad from DSA membership? 499 votes, 86% of you said yes, 4% said no, and 10% said you are not sure. Very interesting. Very interesting.